One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not the same. Oh, hey, all right. I didn't know you were rolling, brother. What do these two things have in common? Other than the fact that they're both short stroke gas piston operated, not much. So let's get on down the rabbit hole and find out how this works and why there's no way in heck I'm burning up an anvil on one of these things. This is our prototypical bag of parts gun. Um, we get some of these in here. I don't know if you've noticed that before. Um, this particular K43, it's all here. Um, we've kind of reassembled it just to make sure that there's nothing really, really majorly stupid wrong with it. Repop wood stock. Um, we've been asked to fix several things. Some unscheduled holes where the ZF4 scope mounts um, have been drilled in this. We want to knock those off fill them in with TIG so that we could be able to just, it'll still look like you're supposed to slide a ZF4 in front of back and have it lock into this groove here. Up front, um, we've got a couple of unscheduled holes that were drilled in this barrel here. We want to fill those holes in. This is repop wood. The action kind of went down into it. It was actually inletted the right way. The bottom metal was bent all the hell, so we took care of that. So, so let's inlet this nose metal. I'll show you how to let something back onto this. This doesn't even remotely fit, and just hauling off and whaling on this isn't going to get you where you want to go. So once we get this set in, and we can see it's really low, so there's a lot of fat down here on the bottom, and I can see a lot of fat down there. Once we get that in, we'll have to drill a hole for this retention device that hangs onto that thing like that. And then the ramrod, we'll worry about the ramrod later. I think there was a cleaning rod. Yeah, there's a cleaning rod hole drilled in this. I'll have to make the man a cleaning rod. Um, this should be a pretty neat piece of kit when we get it done. So in the, in the very first place here, we can do the inletting black. Um, there's, some, there's some black dye on this and you can see right, uh, where do I wanna put that? I'll just put it on my hand. There's like a black dye on here and you guys are wondering why my hands are so beat up. My hands are stained. They're not dirty, they're stained. Um, when I've got to go somewhere or do something, like my daughter's going to get married here, and you bet that I'm going to spend about a day with my hands down in a bucket of peroxide, getting all the mung off of it. So you go, which end is up? Well, most of the swivel hardware is almost always on the left side because the entire military is right-handed. And I know here that in order to come up just rough, I can tell you right off the bat, we're going to have to peel a little bit off the bottom here. We're not even spotting in yet. We're working in planter profile. We're just removing a little bit of wood here. Not too much. But because this isn't an original stock and it has no markings on it and it's totally repop, we're starting from jump straight here. Okay. A good sharp. This is one of the Nicholson 50s while they were still making the nice ones. The, the ones they're making now, not so good. All right. So that will start to slide there. And we can see we're already almost up to the top just to get it to slide on. So what I wanna see now is if we can see if we're not even marking yet, it's not even touching. So we'll do a little bit more and I'll show you how we spot it in. You can use lipstick for this. They make uh, dedicated little bottles. I don't know, I've been using this bottle of inlet, um, inlet indicator for a long time. However, my consumption of reactants has begun to get a little heavier. But if you're just doing this and hacking around, a, a lipstick will work. You, know, you can do whatever you want. The red lipstick is when I'm on like a real dark walnut and it's gotta stand out. This black doesn't stand out well on a walnut. It stands out just fine on wood that's a little bit a little bit lighter like this. Okay, rotate it over. And then we'll slide that up on there. Okay, there's a big black mark right here. 
There's a couple of black marks up underneath the bottom. You can see the black right there. And the black is every place it's touching, right? So we'll leave this upside down. Now you say, why am I doing this with the action in the stock? Well, that's when it's gotta be tight. So we wanna do this, and all we're gonna do now, an incredibly stupidly sharp chisels is really nice. And we're just gonna peel off all of the black stuff. And I'll turn this around and let you see it here in a minute. So what I'm doing is just peeling off all the black marks. It's water soluble, so it doesn't, it'll come off later. I'm not worried about that. Let me just come in here and pop off that line, pop off that line. You don't need to put more of that black stuff on. Once you load this to, uh, toothbrush once, you don't have to load it again. And it's a mess, and it is what it is. Okay, that'll go up there. Now, um, hey, hand me that plastic. Yeah, I need that bad boy right there. Thank you. Okay. So you see it start to shave that wood there? We know it's going to shave that wood. This thing needs to be snug, so it's going to peel off that scraping right there. We know that. We don't want to get crazy with this. Let's go ahead and knock this back off again. And what made that tight was this black spot right here. And you just take the black, and the discipline in this is, is that you know you gotta go another eighth of an inch, but you gotta go an eighth of an inch, 10 thousandths at a time. So in order to go that 125 thou, you gotta do it about 12 times. And that's part of it. If you get in a hurry, it'll look like it was done by a trained rat. It'll fit like it was done by a trained rat. There we go. And then you gotta pay me to unscrew it up. And I just had a conversation with a local individual who's going to find out that I'm not an inexpensive guy to deal with. Okay, we'll just keep going here. Now this chisel is very, very sharp. Now, why am I going out? Well, the grain of the wood, it's like stroking the fur on a cat. If you've ever rubbed the cat's fur the wrong way and you try to cut, the chisel will want to die. But if you do it this way, it just cuts the top off. So it's kind of like petting a cat. That's how it was described to me a long time ago and it just made sense. So that's the metaphor I use. So let's get in here. This K43 we pinned down, it looks like it was uh, made in February of 1945. And the reason why I held up that AR is because with some exceptions, the fire control group is identical. The gas system looks like kind of, a, uh, it almost looks like it was stolen off an SVT 38, SVT 40. It almost looks like it was copied or whichever. And yet, Walter made this. And I would have to tell you, and it's not a G43, it's a K43 after they changed the uh, nomenclature. It is, like most German equipment, overly complex for the job. But that's not me complaining. That's just me making a, uh, a statement there. Okay, here we go. I'm working on the tool in front of me. I've never seen one of these, ever. I've never been in the same room with one, one of these things. I want it a little bit tight, but I don't want it so tight that it can't, that you can't take it off um, by hand. You should be able to at least get the thing apart because it's designed so you can take it apart and deal with it out in the field. Okay, so right now we know we're, we're good and tight. We're, we've got some sawdust popping down there. Let's knock it back off. We're almost there, we're almost down. It's not this complicated. Yeah, let me move that out of the way. Again, if I wasn't doing this for a camera, I would have a much better vantage point. There we go, now it's coming off. Hang on a second, I gotta go do this. Don't, don't move the camera, Bruno. I just gotta get this thing here where I can get it. There we go. 
I just had to stand it up on its nose and knock it off. Okay, so we're coming down here and you can see we're still, now we're starting to print. We're printing right here. And yeah, you can do this with a file, but when you do it with a file, I mean a, a rasp, you tear the wood fibers. And I don't want to tear the fibers. I would like to do a minimum of cleanup. I'd like to preserve the finish on this, uh, on this wood so that I don't have to do it over again. Personal note to the gentleman that owns this gun, I am really sorry I've had it as long as I've had it. But it, we did a lot of research to understand what we were getting into here before we did this. So whenever you do a conservation or you're going to make modifications or you're going to put a gun together in a, from a bag, uh, you've got to make sure that when it's done, you understand how it works, so that you know how to safety check it. It has to pass muster. It has to pass muster. Now, recoil pad file, right? So this is one of those files that I own that's never touched, uh, never touched steel. This side here has been ground smooth so that I can get up against stuff. It's called a safe edge. I can get up against stuff like this. Let's start washing this off and making this smooth here. We're just about there. Now remember, if you remove material from the bottom, the piece goes up. So just because it marked on the bottom doesn't mean that we have to cut both sides off. So you can move this around by what you remove where, and you can actually steer the piece right on to where you're trying to go. Let's see here. This is getting a lot easier. We're getting there. I gotta tell you, we're getting pretty close. We've touched down in the front. So now we're gonna pop this off one more time and then clean all this up with files. We're gonna be there and then we'll move on to something else. So, ah, we'll stand this up like this and just kind of, see it's not that hard to, not that hard to come off. We'll drop down. Right, there you go, we're almost there. Am I still in frame? Okay. Now you can use a file because files don't rip the rip the uh, grain up as bad. Okay. Just a couple of thou at a time, guys. We're gonna peel off that little lip that we we lifted. We got it close. Get rid of all the black. You can see we got some black on the front where we touched down. That's good. Roll this up. We're just about there. Yep. The last thing we'll do now is the top of this piece. And then we'll be done. All right, I'll just go ahead and put that up in there. Mount that so that that slips backwards back into its mortise. One more time. Remember now, I want it tight because I don't want it to rattle around. I just don't want it so tight that if the wood expands, you can't take the gun apart. There we go. That should be us right there. Okay. And I'm just, I'm just tapping it. I'm not hitting it real hard. And bang, we're down. We're touching, we're touching. A little bit of stain will clean that up. That's the nose cap. So all I gotta do now is drill a hole. That'll sit up underneath. We'll bend it as necessary. That'll run up. It'll snick in. And the nose cap's on. The customer wanted new springs put in this and he gave me the springs. So we're gonna put in new springs. We need to take it apart in order to do the welding. So while I've got it torn down, we're gonna go in here and get rid of all of this scrode up underneath the ejector tunnel. We're gonna look at a couple of things. 
This gas system here is new. It's, uh, this gas tube was new and it's threaded for these variable sized gas orify. I have the smallest one provided in the gun right now and it worked great and it was spitting the empties. We're fine, but this is a great idea to neck this gun down because the hole that's in it right now is half the size, which is a heck of a lot less than half the area of the hole that was originally in it. And I cannot imagine running this thing straight. Uh, a couple other things here. All right, we've got all the parts pulled out of it. And for those of you that are actually familiar with an AR-15 lower here, there's a, a spring-loaded disconnector, and there's the hammer, and then on, in, inside this, there's a trigger when you rock it back and forth, rocks that whole thing back and forth. Well, I got news for you. There's the hammer. This is the trigger bar, and except for not having the trigger hanging down off the bottom of this, the trigger is back here. Let me get this out of the way here. Um, here, let me get back up in the center here real quick. Bang, bang, bang. So on an AR-15, there'd be a stick sticking down here, and when you pull back on a trigger, it would do this, and the safety would ride back here. All that's, the, the only thing different in this setup is, is that when you, there's a set screw here that sets the first stage of take up. So you grab this and it takes up, and then as you're pulling it to the rear, it pushes back on the bar, pivots it forward, bang. So it's got a two-stage tr trigger pull, which is actually pretty good, I might add. I, I've kind of enjoyed shooting this. But the deal is, is that a gun that was designed in World War II has got the same setup on it that an AR-15 has on it. There's nothing new here. These are some of the holes we have to plug up in the back here where the ZF-4 went. Uh, this screw that's in here, it was obviously snapped off. It was sticking into the raceway for the for the bolt shroud. Yeah, so we're gonna weld the, the gun's gonna get refinished anyway. Um, and from what I've been told, it's kind of a parkerized and then blued over the top of parkerization. We're gonna try that, but you, you, we're, we're not gonna make you guys have to sit through it. Anyway, we're gonna weld all this up. And then there was another one up front. It almost looks like somebody tried to mount some kind of sporting sight on this thing. I have no clue. But uh, we're going to burn some rod, and then uh, there won't be much more left. done a few things on the bench uh, before we came out here. We noted that the chamber was extremely dirty. The very first round that got put in this thing, um, it really come out looking nasty. Take a look at it. Yeah. So we went ahead and took a chamber reamer, just kissed it, cleaned it out, didn't move any metal. Uh, this K43 is notorious for being very overgassed. The repop gas system that we have in it has variable orifices in it. We have the smallest orifice. So all we are trying to attempt to do here with one round is just verify that it'll go bang and possibly reset the uh, disconnector. I have the bolt hold open gone out of this. So let's just see what it does, but the bolt will not hang open. Ah, but the safety's on, you see, that's a good thing. Okay, the empty round came out of the gun. The empty's out, the chamber's clear. So we know the least amount of gas is going to be enough and that's what we're gonna stay with. So now that we know that it'll eject, we're gonna try for a disconnector test two rounds. We're gonna verify that the gun goes off one time. I turn the, my finger loose. We listen to it reset, shoot it again, turn my finger loose. And since the bolt stops out of it, the bolt should be shot and the hammer should drop the third time.
three independent drops of the hammer, exactly what I'm looking for. Outstanding. I have been afforded the privilege of working on some pretty interesting equipment. This late war production K43 is one of them, some gunsmithing required. And as always, it's been a pleasure to share some of its details with you. Catch you guys on the flip side.